Peace and love, family. How is everyone doing tonight? Thank you for joining us on another edition of the Ram Book Club, Resurgence of the African Mind, where we seek to liberate African minds by reading one unit of work at a time. Family, as you know, right now we are reading The African Personality in America, an African Center Framework by Dr. Kobe Cambon. Last week, family, we wrapped up chapter four, the African personality structure and basic traits. We talked about African personality traits and some of those tra traits were rhythmic, fluid, physiomotor responsiveness, ebonic, strong religious connections, etc. This week, family, we're getting into chapter five, the African personality development. My name is Lili Lapoete Speaks, AKA Alima Njai. To get the links to join the panel or to listen in the discussion, you go to www.lililapoetespeaks.com, family. Click on the African personality in America link and scroll down to the appropriate chapter. Family, I am the author of Perceptions of a Misplaced African, Volume 1. Dr. Ma'at is holding that up. Good look, Dr. Ma'at. If you don't have your copy, family, you can get your copy today. You can use coupon code I love Lily, L U V L E L E, for 30% off your copy today, family. Also, you can get the ebook at Amazon.com if you prefer the ebook. Thank you guys for joining us. We're going to let the panel introduce themselves and peace and love. Peace, love, and light. My name is Dr. Oya Ma'at, a.k.a. Dr. Deanna Bailey. I am the co-founder and uh, vice president of Ed, uh, vice president, the co-founder and vice president of Ed Anime Productions. I'm also the executive producer of the Meltrek series. Let me hold it up for you. All right. So Meltrek is a comprehensive uh, program that teaches children history from an Afrocentric perspective. Uh, currently, we have Meltrek Episode 1, Exploring Ancient Africa, available, and also Meltrek Episode 2, Exploring the Pre-Columbian Americas. We also have, and I'm showing you a messed up copy because my son has read it to death, we have the Meltrek, uh, Meltrek Exploring Ancient Africa storybook. Um, if you just simply Google Meltrek, um, links to purchase our products should uh, populate. I'm also a lecturer, looks as though I'm a full-time lecturer, sis, now at the School of Engineering at Morgan State um, University. Full time, full time. Y'all heard that, full time. That's hot, man. That's, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get there, man. Salute that, salute that. No doubt, no doubt, King, but thank you, family. But yeah, yeah, I'm there full time now, um, teaching uh, in the electrical engineering department. Um, my focus is signal processing. I teach uh, electric circuits, electric circuits lab, signal processing, and uh, wireless communications. So. They're full-time family, so that's where you can find me also. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to our brother, our brother, Jonathan. Yes. My name is Sean Polador. I'm here in the small town of St. Martinville, Louisiana. I am a public speaker. Also, uh, our first uh, self-published book, What's Your Kick? It's a self-help book, The Guide to Unlocking Your Passion. You can find it on Amazon.com, also in Kindle for download. And also, I am a child psychologist. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Hold on, let me let some folks, other folks know on my other page that we are live. I just shared it on Facebook. Yes, let them know that we are live. Let me see, let me go to another page and tell them we are live. So look, last week as Sister Alima stated, um, we talked about the seven um, basic personality, I don't even wanna call them basic, but the seven uh, common African personality traits. Um, and one of the traits uh, is rhythm. She said rhythm, fluid, physiomotor responsiveness. So the way we move, the way we dance. And I remember um, asking if the Masi Warrior Clan or um, Brother Kofi Pisces had um, a presentation on African dance. And he absolutely does. And they absolutely do. And so let me pull it up and we'll definitely make sure that we at this link to the chat. So if you go to Pisces TV, you can go to Kofi Pisces TV. Um, you see right here that I'm subscribed and I have my notifications turned on. So whenever the brother um, uploads a video, I get alerted. So he has a lot of wonderful presentations here. But as you can see, family, right here, look at my mouse. He has a presentation that he did about four months ago called Africans Dance, Dance, Dance. Um, I watched it last week. He actually has a, he has another, um, if you go to his Facebook page, he has another presentation called uh, African Dance, Dance, Dance Reloaded, uh, which is about an hour long. I watched that one, and I know that this one kind of expounds on the, the information presented in the Reloaded one. Um, so I didn't watch this one, but I did watch the Reloaded 
um, African Dance 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 presentation. It was wonderful. He started, he talked to us about um, the four types of dances that Africans would typically do. And they are ritual dances, uh, ceremonial dances, communal dances, and um, oh my gosh, it's communal, ritual, ceremonial. Oh my gosh, and the fourth one is griotic, griotic dances. Okay, so those are those four types of dances that our Africans would typically do. And, um, and so he talks about that and he talked about the drum being the heartbeat of the community and how you could tell the mood of the community based on the music, the drumming and the dancing. You know, so, you know, the music and the dancing uh, reflected the mood of the community. He got into that. So it's a wonderful presentation. So I, I implore you guys to definitely uh, check it out. So let me stop sharing my screen. It's time. Yes, it was. I got to go watch that. Man. It was a tight. It was a tight presentation. It, it was tight. All right. So, um, Sister Alima, do you want to kick it off, Queen? All righty, family. I can I can actually kick it off, Queen, because I mean the first um, paragraph, in my opinion, um, was very powerful. Summed it up, didn't he? Yeah, he summed it up really in the first paragraph, and it seems like he just kind of elaborated. Um, throughout the chapter, but you know, I started at most contemporary Black African families. I'm at the same place. Yes, most contemporary Black African families in their vital socialization role of African children do not provide even the slightest consciousness emphasis related to African culture reality. Mm. Or the reality of white European supremacy domination of African people and methods for surviving its lethal tentacles. Nor does the so-called Black church or school formal education system provides such vital Afrocentric socialization and training. Contributing to this overall problem is the fact that African social cultural scientists have not yet developed Afrocentric parenting models or guidelines and prescriptions for African parents on how to raise African centered children under conditions of white supremacy, cultural imposition and domination. I mean, sis, Powerful. That, that was I, when I looked at that. Like yeah, I'm yeah. up here with it, you know, I got it all highlighted. But that was extremely possible. That was extremely yes. powerful. He said, "Thus, yes. our children are left virtually defenseless right. in of the inevitable and overwhelming anti-African confrontation that will characterize and dominate much of their lives under the current system of Eurasian world order. It is as if the African family in North America, in particular." through the process of racial integration and Eurocentric miseducation of African people has lost its mm -hmm. racial cultural integrity, its, its yes. racial cultural memory, and therefore mm -hmm. its racial cultural consciousness. Wow. And that's a fact. Um, if we don't understand mm -hmm. the European reality, right? Or the, the European cultural reality or the, um, or the African cultural reality, how, is, how can we properly rear our children you, you get what i'm saying so that they will be so that that so that we can guarantee their survival how can you do that if you are ignorant of uh these cultural realities it's impossible so our children are unprepared because we have a poor socialization process we do and i, I think for a lot of households they think if we don't discuss race and we don't discuss culture and things like that then my child's gonna be uh, immune or exempt to facing certain ills. And it's actually the most dangerous thing not to make them aware. And your child finally in junior high on the bus, and somebody finally call them the N-word, or somebody finally say a certain term to them, it's like they're so off guard and so off balance, they don't know what to do with that information. They don't. And where did this come from? Because the mama spent so many years trying to shield them and guard them from, well, we're not gonna talk about race, we're not gonna talk about the past and history and slavery and oppression, we're not gonna discuss that. So therefore, your child's more vulnerable than, than protected. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, brother. So brother um said, brother, Baba, he goes on to say that he said we we are as a community virtually without any African centered and African controlled educational, economic, religious, political institutions, right? He says that historically black colleges and universities are governed by the miseducated and anti-African educational model of Eurocentric worldview, as are the elementary and secondary educational systems in our communities. Since education would under normal circumstances constitute 
a critical seedbed for African recovery from our Ma'afa and our, and our cultural redevelopment as a diasporian African nation, then without African controlled education, Africans are locked into a no-win situation relative to our psychological and cultural liberation from Eurocentric conceptual imprisonment. We Africans must therefore develop African-centered socialization and educational models to propel the liberation and transformation processes required for African self-determination and affirmation. That is African nation building, maintenance in the modern world, African socialization and education, in my view, must be designed to define, cultivate, and reinforce African nation building and maintenance. Can I, can I say something right quick? You can say anything you want, brother. <laughs> okay, so at this point, this is my first reference point, right? And I'm traveling right now, so I don't have my books on me, but I'll give you what I remember. In the uh, University of Kemet Press book, African K through 12, in the introduction and the preface, he pretty much breaking down whenever we tried to have African-centered schools and after-school programs and things like that from the 40s and the 50s, yeah. we've, there, oh, there it is, there. boom. Uh, we've always either been funded by Europeans in some kind of way, or we're using their curriculum, so we're breaking off from their schools, but trying to be like them. Uh, and this is the importance of having to fund our own stuff, make our own curriculums, do our own archaeology, write our own books, you know, the whole night, do our own teaching and stuff like that. And if you don't do that, you're pretty much still using the European model, uh, long story short. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you brought this book to the family's attention. This is a powerful book. I haven't yes, gotten is. to study it yet. I just read a couple of pages, and um, but it's a powerful read. There's a lot of good diagrams in the back of the book. A lot of good uh, diagrams and images and stuff in the back of the book. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but I know for a fact, mm -hmm. African-American school here where I live at in Louisiana, they appear to be like totally African-American. You might have seen them on the news even because there are so many kids going to Harvard and Yale and Columbia and Brown and they're going viral on the news and breaking records. They're going on, what you call that lady? Uh, Ellen and all that kind of stuff. But when I asked the principal and the owner of that school, could I go over there and do an african center curriculum? He told me, well, you know what, brother? Give me an overview. I got to run it by Harvard. I got to run it by Yale. I got to run it by Princeton to make sure it, it appeases them, and then we'll mm. go from there. So I realized in that moment, you can't do what you want to do. No. You just appear to do what you want to do, but you still got to pretty much, you, you're you in bed with these people, long story short. Absolutely. You're in bed, you're in bed with them. Sorry. Absolutely. And let's think about this. Let's think about this. I mean, let's really think about this, brother. Um, The whole goal of this system, this system is really set up to maintain white power, to maintain Euro-American power, right? So we got to ask ourselves you know, one fundamental question. Why, if someone wants to main, that maintain their power, why would they educate you in such a way, right? Why would they educate you to empower you if they need to maintain power? Because I know that if I want to maintain power, I'm not going to go out <laughs> yeah. here and provide yeah. people with education, right? that can challenge my power. It goes against the art of war. It goes against the 48 laws of power. It goes Absolutely. against every, the 33 strategies of war. I mean, you name any kind of publication like that, it goes totally against that. Absolutely, brother. So I don't understand why we would think, and, and I understand why we think it, because, you know, our mama sent us to public school. So we see yeah, yeah. our babies <laughs> yeah, grow up yeah. and, and they're right. in public school. It's a cycle. You know, it's it's a cycle, and so we just have to break that cycle, brother. And um, and that's yeah. this entire. That's what I'm also. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about the book, uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the Miseducational of Course, and he made a, a paraphrasing about sometimes the more learned and the higher educated we get in the European systems, is the yeah. more useless we are in our own communities. Facts. That's a fact. And so I had I had a mentor my whole six years in college to get my master's. He always made it on the front of my conscience, like, remember why you were in school. Remember what you were in school for. Remember you were in school to learn this system and bring it back to our community, That's back right. to our people. Right. And so 
So every book I read of theirs, I read like 20 of our books the whole time you. in school. Exactly. To try to immune myself from that very thing that Dr. Carter G. Wilson spoke of. That's right. That's right. Well said, brother. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very. So I he goes, you <laughs> we missed you too. We missed your, your perspective. Um, but he goes, Baba goes on to say that an African Afrocentric developmental space. So he, he's basically promoting an Afrocentric developmental space. And he's saying in this chapter that um, our children are developing in a, and of course a Eurocentric developmental space and that uh, the effects and, and because of this, um, they suffer from a lot of psychopathologies and, and brother Jonathan, I know you're in the school system. And so you see, it. so you see the results of of, of, our, of our children being cultivated um, in a Eurocentric uh, system, right? So he's yeah. saying that the optimal um, developmental space for African children would be an Afrocentric developmental space, okay? Yeah. And he goes on to say on page one ten, he says that an Afrocentric developmental space is best conceived is best conceived of of as compromising as compromising an African-centered family home environment organized around the purpose of African nation building maintenance. This would consist of African parents, the presence of African-centered cultural icons and symbols, and most, important, and most importantly of all, the teaching and practicing of African-centered cultural values, rituals, and activities which awaken and strengthen African spirituality and affirm the dignity, integrity, and worth of African life, as well as the prioritization of its maintenance, defense, and survival. All right. So he's saying that that is the African de developmental space. Then he goes on to talk about the Eurocentric developmental space. And he's saying that, the, in contrast, the Eurocentric developmental space for African children is defined by the dominance of Euro Eurocentric white supremacy values, rituals, and practices in defining the significant others in cultural, environmental, experiential, experiential space. This could encompass the family home environment, the school and neighborhood environments, the church and other interfacing broader community, institutional and societal structures impacting African life in America, such as the mass media, pay attention family, electronic and entertainment media, economic structure, legal or judicial structure, political structures, et cetera, okay? So then he goes on to talk about how the Eurocentric space encroaches upon or overtakes the Afrocentric space in the developmental matrix of African children. That's a fact. Yes. That's a fact. Yes. All right, so he's saying that it, it encroaches upon that, right? So our children are being Europeanized, okay? And this is yes. causing a lot of psychological an emotional, um, uh, what am I looking for, Jonathan? I didn't, I didn't, a lot of, uh, Sister Lima, give me my word, because I lost my train that fast. I was going An emotional damage? Damage, problems, right? I'm thinking about the W.E.B. Du Bois talking about the double consciousness. Come on, let's go, brother. And you in conflict with yourself, and I talked to enough sisters, even my wife sometimes talking about this, uh, like having the locks that you have, for example, or having the afro, and you feel I can't wear myself at work. Mm, yeah. So for the 40, 40 or 50 hours a week, I got to be somebody else. You're mm. in total conflict with yourself. I can't dress like this. I can't smell like shea butter. I can't wear locks. I can't do this. I can't do that. So you always competing with yourself. You can't never just wake up and go to work. You got to consider so many things before you go to work or even our kids going to school. You know, absolutely. So it's a double consciousness. Yourself. That's torment. That's torment. Yeah. I mean, that's psychological yeah. torment to wake up every day and can't and don't feel free to be you. You, you get what I'm saying? To be you, automatically yeah, you. You know, that's that's torment. That's torment. I feel so sorry and so angry and frustrated inside of myself whenever these sisters around me, because I've always had more female friends than guy friends. We're having these dialogues one on one, and they're all saying the same thing. I can't be myself. It's not going to imagine what are you telling your parents because you're trying to protect your kids. So, how do you send your daughter to school? If you can't go to work like that, you're going to send your daughter to school, Europeanized. Right. Because we're so scared to offend them, we're so scared to make them uncomfortable. 
Like we're doing them a favor. Absolutely. I don't understand it. <laughs> Absolutely, brother. And then, you know, um, and I said psychological and emotional and um, social, I'm sorry, psychological and emotional problems. But Dr. Kobe Cambon talks, and I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at page 113. He's saying that, um, that when we raise our children in a Eurocentric environment, he says that it brings about or precipitates a deeply rooted inferiority complex. Um, he said it also uh, decreases our self-esteem. And yes. you know, typically when we think of self-esteem, we think of how we feel about ourselves. But Dr. Kobe Cambon tells us that there are different degrees of self-esteem. You have personal self-esteem, racial self-esteem, cultural self-esteem, academic self, academic self-esteem, um, athletic, and social uh, self-esteem. So your self-esteem has many dimensions. It's, it's not yeah. just it's not yeah. as simple as it's not as simple as just oh how you feel about yourself. It's how you feel about your race, your cultural, your, your race, you, your right. culture, right, your right, patients. So it has so, many dimensions. So he's saying that when we rear our children in a Eurocentric, um, in a Eurocentric space, developmental space that uh, we end up um, creating uh, uh, an inferiority complex and also uh, low self-esteem. And, um, and we right. recognize this. I, I mean, I know that everyone has heard of the doll test. Um, you've heard of the doll test that was performed by Dr. Um, oh my gosh, um, what is his name? Kenneth. Dr. I don't have it memorized, but. What was his name? Dr. Kenneth. Oh, I, I don't have it memorized, but I know what you mean. Absolutely. I know that it was it, it was in the it was during Brown versus Board of Education. It took place a few years prior to uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. And it was a husband and wife team. Uh, they were psychologists and they um, performed what is called the doll test and uh, and found out that black children suffer from an inferiority complex. And that's when they yes. were talking about that. That was in the 1940s. He looked better, brother. I think his name was Dr. Kim. I'm trying to find it right. I'm trying to find it right now, man. Yeah, so yeah, look that up because I want to make sure that I'm uh, Doctors Kenneth and Mamie Clark, the dog yeah. test in 1940s. Absolutely, the yes. A series of experiments known as colloquially as to study the psychological effects of segregation on the African American children. Absolutely, and then there was a sister by the name of Kara Davis in 2005. Um, she uh, did the doll test again, she performed the doll test again. I want to say in New York and found out that the results were the same. So they conducted this doll test in the 1940s. Here it is, this sister, her name is Kara Davis. She came along and um, she came along and she conducted the test uh, nearly, what, 50 years later, 60 years later, and found out that the results were still the same. You wanna know why? Because the education is still the same. The society is still the same, right? Our kids are still being reared in a Euro Eurocentric developmental space they still um, they still go to school and they are exposed to a Eurocentric curriculum. They still watch television, right? They have Eurocentric parents, Eurocentric grandparents, uh, a Eurocentric environment. So why would the results be different? So the results were the same, and this was in two thousand and five. All right, brother Jonathan, are you there? All right, brother. So he goes on to say that almost all African children so victimized, he says, however, will invariably possess a moderate to severe racial culture and cultural inferiority complex, low racial cultural self-esteem, a moderate to strong materialistic orientation, competitiveness and aggression, and almost without exception, a strong individualistic orientation. Hence their perceptions and behavior will manifest anti-African content. So you say you wonder why our kids don't mind shooting each other, right? You say you don't mind, they don't mind shooting each other, killing each other, and harming one another. Well, they have an anti-African disposition, okay? Very much and so. Oh, absolutely. And it says in these uh, manifestations, uh, 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 yeah, go ahead, brother. No, I was just going to talk about the amount of colorism that I see around me working with teenage kids and things like that. And of course, they're at the age whenever they are participating in. Uh, uh, sexual intercourse and things like that, but these teenage boys that are pretty much uh, melanated <laughs> are saying how they want to have a baby with a woman of a different race merely for the fact of it'll make a quote unquote a prettier baby. Mm. So yeah, they're, they're pretty much voicing the baby got to have a certain kind of eyes. It's not just the brothers; you have you know young sisters 
who say that I wanna, I, they, I wanna have a pretty baby. So they go get a, a, a white boy or a Hispanic boy. Yeah. It's the women say the same thing, brother. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I just happen to be around more guys than girls in my work, but uh, I can believe it. <laughs> I believe it's is a uh, across the board situation. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's 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 crazy. So that's because they have it says anti-African content. It says in these manifestations yes. will likely increase as they grow older, as they are permitted to engage in more and more independent action. In short, African collective life achieves a very low value in the psychology of Europeanized African children. Europeanized African child or personality is thus characterized by a weak African self-consciousness in their psychological infrastructure. Therefore, African nation building maintenance will be the very last item if it is if it exists at all on the Europeanized African child's agenda because their lives have been thrust or organized around the prioritization of, of European nation building maintenance. The ultimate outcome or product of Eurocentric socialization of African children can only consist of African self-destruction. I'm sitting here thinking about the song yes. in the 90s, brother. Remember self-destruction. Self-destruction. Yeah, self <laughs> totally, totally. But that, um, that's real. And what you just said is what I told those kids I spoke to at that uh, the African American school I'm telling you about. Those are very exceptional kids intellectually. And I made sure in my speech, I always made them aware. Okay, after you go to Harvard, after you go to Yale, after you go to Princeton, be conscious of what you bring back home. What are you going to do back home? After you leave and walk off and get your degrees and all that, how are you going to help your cousins that couldn't afford to go to this school? Right. How you going to help your, your aunts and, uh, and uncles that couldn't get a high school diploma for whatever reason? How you going to be back? Uh, 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 how you going to be an asset? What I'm trying to say to the community when you finish doing all of that. Exactly. Don't go off into your gated community and your two dogs and your kids going to private school. where you thinking everything all good. Like it goes beyond yourself. Absolutely. And see, and, and see, again, that's that's being inculcated with the alien worldview. Remember, that's not even our worldview because as African people, we're communal people, right? So we back to that. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So when you back, see back to that divorce, talking about the talented tenth and the the elitist kind of thing, like mm -hmm. you don't want to be so individualized and just want to separate yourself from everybody that don't have some of the advantages you have, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And so what I was saying, brother, is that um that is the European, that's because they've been inculcated with the European worldview, right? It's real. It's and, real. Or they call it European exologies. And one of those exologies are or is um, individualism. Yes, ma'am. Totally. And you mentioned the word rituals in your reading a little while ago. And I went to uh, Destruction of a Black Civilization by Dr. Chancellor Williams. And I told you almost a year ago, we talked one time offline about he gave a whole layout of the rites of passage for the African uh, boys and girls mm. from birth from birth through adulthood at certain phases in life, what they will be introduced to, what they will be asked to do, what they had to show mastery of by the time they became a uh, adult, if you will, you know? And those rituals were always keeping them African centered, keeping them in line, keeping them Absolutely. aware. Keeping you aware, keeping you grounded, you know, in your values, and, uh, and in your culture, and in your culture. And see, and Dr. Kobe Cambon also gets into that, so I'm glad that you brought that up. He gets into that on page 117. Uh, he talks about African-centered um, life cycle rituals and initiation, transformation rights and development right. timetables. So let me pull that up, brother. Won't you read that to the family? I have it right here. Let me lock my screen. So let's talk about the African-centered life cycle and rituals um, that will keep you grounded in your values and your culture. And like you said, and what you, your purpose, your mission. So go ahead and read, read those, brother. Okay. So uh, recognition of concept of ceremonial right. I said the three-month uh, pregnancy mark, uh, focusing on recognition of the special gifts, sacredness, and continuity of African life and anticipated responsibilities and obligations of the family slash community. It also focuses on the anticipation 
of the new life's potential, critical participation in the African nation building mission of the family slash community. The next is the naming, naming ceremonial, right? Shortly after birth to two years old, focus on communal recognition of the new member in African commu community, uh, continu continuity through selection and conferring of a traditional African name and dedication of a newborn's life to the primary mission of the African nation building and maintenance. Next, you have the childhood ceremonial rite, ages three through eight years old. Fo focus on the family slash community, conveying the role, expectations, responsibilities, and obligations for the African child participation in the family and community's mission of African nation building and maintenance. It emphasizes the sacredness of African life, African continuity and survival through ancestral, ancestral communion, uh, complementary female and male qualities, and commitment to African centered excellence and development of the Mayatin qualities and character, conduct slash social relations, and creative abilities and skill development for African leadership. Next, adolescence passage right. This is from nine and a half years old to well, nine through 17 years old. Focus on preparation for more substantive participation in African nation building through Afrocentric female and male adult roles, functions, physically, mentally, spiritually, within the African community through crystallizing and heightening communal expectations for his or her obligation and responsibilities to the African community. Next, the adulthood initiate right. This is pretty much 18 through 39 years old. Focus on recognizing young man and woman's new status within the community, his and her communal obligations and responsibility in the African nation building maintenance, the resources and Rose, I'm trying to see it. Where are we, brother? We're on number five, the adulthood reciprocation. Right. Reciprocation. The screen went off. No, it's still there. For the screen. It's still there. Oh, no, it, it, hold on. <laughs> All right, let Hold me. On, while, while you're talking, I, I, there you go. There you go. I got it. I got it. I got it. Oh, look. I got it. That accompany of African adulthood, precipi precipitation for the <laughs> anti. Whenever she speaks, the screen goes off for me. Okay, so let me read it. Preparation for an African centric Maatian adult life, selecting career, vocation, and other activities geared toward the fulfillment of African nation building maintenance. Pre preparation for marriage and African familyhood, parenting, and the responsibility for mentoring, apprenticing young members of the community. Number six, middle age, passive rights, age 40 to 59, focuses on patches through the midpoint of life and the personal reflecting accounting for his or her African center, Maatian practices, and African nation building maintenance as witnessed by the community, elders, peers, family, and taking on, I can't read the bottom. Yeah. Um, that's and taking on critical responsibilities of leadership and mentoring, uh, apprenticing younger members of the community. And they're, they're the last two. Can you, can and then number seven focuses on the critical role of eldership in the African community and special authority, privileges, obligations, and responsibilities that accompany it and the recipro reciprocations incumbent on this distinguished process of African cultural con continuity such as providing leadership and wise counsel for the community and mentoring apprenticing young members of the community. It also focuses on personal preparation for ancestral status and Maatian judgment. Number eight, physical death elevation to the ancestralhood passage rite. This rite may occur either as one ceremony, a two-stage ceremony, or as two separate ceremonies. It focuses on the communal family community celebration of the physical spiritual life, Maatian legacy of the departed in relation to African nation building maintenance, interconnectedness of the community to the departed, the laying of the body of the departed to rest funeral, and the escorting of the deceased African spirit to the realm of the ancestors. Excellent. So as you can see, family, there was a right. Let me um, stop sharing my screen now. There was a right. I don't want to keep saying a rite of passage, but there was always some sort of ritual or initiation or trans. It says transformation, right, transformation, yes. right, or develop, you know, transformation, right. Uh, at every phase of your life. So when your mother right. was pregnant, when you were born, when you were in childhood, when you came into adolescence, when you started your journey as an adult, when you got older and became what I call a senior adult, and then when you became an elder, then when you trans you transitioned, transitioned. Uh, yeah, right. to the ancestral realm. So 
it seems like in every phase of your life, there was some sort of uh, ritual or initiation or right that, yeah. hold on, let me finish, brother, that kept yeah. you grounded, that kept you grounded in your values, your culture, and kept you focused on your mission. And so that is extremely, extremely important. And let me share my screen with you guys one more time, because there's a presentation, again, the Masi Warrior Clan, on the Masi Warrior Clan's uh, channel, and um, on uh, brother Kofi Paisa, Oh, here, there we go. On his channel, he has a rites of passage presentation. Short and sweet, it's about an hour and a half. Um, where is it? Beautiful presentation I watched a while ago. Um, here it is African rites of passage birth. So, an hour and a half. He did this about seven months ago. So, you can go to Kofi Paisa TV or go to the Masi Warrior Clan channel. I'm pretty sure. Let me go check it out. This is on his channel, but I'm pretty sure that it's on the Masi Warrior Clan channel also. And as you can see, I'm subscribed to both. I love what these brothers are doing um, in the community. So let me see. Yeah. I got the camera on, Jay. Well, thank you, honey, bunch. All right, rites of passage. I need to watch the Mansa Musa one. Okay, so we don't I don't think they okay, so they don't have the rites of passage one um on this particular channel. So you can go to Kofi Paisa Television Paisa TV to watch both of those presentations that I mentioned um earlier. And as you can see, Masi Warrior Clan has a lot of a lot of um, a lot of informative presentations um, on their page. So please subscribe and, and check them out, family. So moving on. Yes, they do. Yeah, so moving on, did you want to add something, brother? No, uh, I was thinking about, once again, in child psychology, and I'm dealing with mostly young males, and you know you get this typical 13 or 12-year-old boy feeling like, man, I'm a grown man. No right. adult can tell me what to do. I'm a grown, but you don't even know any life skills. You don't know how to cook for yourself, how to clean, how to provide, how to do anything. So you have no real mile marker to making you what you feel like is a man. That's right. Nobody in our society is really checking the balance in that. Even at 18, 19 years old, because you graduate high school, that's our only real mile marker to say, well, he's a grown man now. He should know better. Right. Or we just go by age, as like like European. Right. right. Yes, ma'am. As soon as you hit 18, then you're supposed to have all your shit together. You're supposed to know everything, know what you want to do in life. Mm -hmm. and you know that more than likely that's not the case, you know? And yes. so many of us not ready to leave at 18. Yeah. And black parents need to stop kicking their damn children out the house just because they're yes, 18 or even if they're 21. If, did you prepare them to move out is the question. If you yourself did not prepare them to move out, then you don't have the right to put them out. They're still your responsibility until you prepare them. At the end of the day, that's your damn job. Yes, to prepare ma them to be, to be sufficient adults. Yes, ma'am. That's spot on. Yeah, that's spot on. Yeah, that's spot on. And like you said, Sister Alima, a lot of us, and I say us because I, you know, I think of, of we when I speak. That's right. We haven't prepared us. We haven't prepared our children at all. We haven't. We haven't prepared them, and we have failed um, miserably. We yeah. have. Yeah. You know, time I, I drive past, um, there's a 7-Eleven down the street from my home, and um, you know, especially during the summertime, you know, you see hordes of, of young people just standing outside, you know, with nothing to do, sis. Yeah, just outside, you know, the store. all day, queen, all day long. And it's like, you know, I, I feel bad for them. I'm like, you know, they're not they're not they're not involved in any type of extracurricular activities, um, projects. They're not doing anything with their family. You know, they're just really wasting time, just wasting their youth, wasting their um, talents and abilities. Exactly. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of bright kids. You, you know what I mean, Sister Alima? Exactly. I, you know, exactly. But, but no one's taking the time to, to mold them. And, and as uh, Brother Sean said, to teach them, you know, about manhood, about womanhood. They're just left out to dry. So we are failing. And I and my, and, you know, there's some people who say, Dr. Maya, I'm not failing. I'm taking care of mine. No. If one child is failing or lost, we are fail. failing. Yeah. You know? that's yeah. But that's yeah. what we say, though. We say that often, especially I'm hearing that new dynamic now in the conscious community. 
Well, if you, you need to worry about your family and get your family together because what can you offer? Okay, I get that. But once your family is together, then what? Because right. what? If you have your kids together, but if I didn't raise my kids together, they're going to pull your motherfucking kids in with mine. Absolutely. That, that, that's the mentality that we have. That's that European mindset, thinking that we all don't piggyback off one another because yes, the fuck we do. Yeah. Our, our, our destinies are tied. Our destinies are inextricably bounded together. And I don't, and we don't understand that, sis. You know, we don't understand, you know, what happens to one happens to all, right? And, and I remember that this this reminds me of a quote by uh, Mamie Till. Mamie Till, uh, prior to uh, her son Emmett Till being murdered in 1955, she said that when she was living in Chicago, she had her job, you know, she had her son, he was in school. And she said when she would hear about things that happened to Negroes in the South, she said, oh, that's their problem. Right. Let them deal with it until it happened to her. Right. She said, this when she realized what happens to one happened to us all. Right. You know, and so we, we you know, we got to understand that. But um, so Dr. Not Dr. Uh, Kobe Cambon did a wonderful job uh, presenting the African-centered life cycle rituals. Again, these rituals. And see, that's another thing, sis. When I think of slavery, when I think of the ma'afa, oftentimes we focus on the abuse from slavery, you know, we say, oh, we were, you know, abused, we were murdered, we were raped, we were psychologically assaulted, we were cut off from our families, um, you know, we lost a lot of wealth, but but rarely do we talk about the cultural, di the, the effects of the cultural discontinuity, yes. the effects right. of cultural alienation. Yes. You know, because our, absolutely, because our ancestors put certain things in place uh, Dr. Naeem Akbar in his book, Know Thyself, calls it immunities, things in place to protect us. This, so these rituals were developed for a reason, right? You know, bringing you into manhood, rites of passage. Well, these things were put in place for a reason. It was to protect us and to reaffirm ourselves and our culture. And so when the Ma'afa happened, you know, we talked about, you know, of the things, oh, they stripped us from our name, our God and our religion and all that. But what was really devastating was cultural discontinuity and cultural alienation. I agree. You think of a culture, sis. Your culture is what protects you. The That's culture right. is what fortifies you. Right. And so when one destroys your culture, they destroy your people. That's right. Yes. That's right. And they the money. The yes. knew that. They knew that when they brought us over here, they knew that they would have to revamp our minds and our way of thinking. Because like, like we already know, we are communal people. We are a community of people. So they had to break that down and read us. Like Dr. Ma'at said, they had to snatch that culture away. They did. And they right. our ancestors right. tried their best to hold on to it as much as possible, you know? But by the time we can yes. our generation, oh, it's damn near gone. That's right. I know, I know being here in Louisiana, you know, of course you have the heavy... Uh, influences as far as like voodoo, for example, and other spiritual practices. And I'm really enjoying, of course, uh, the Black Panther, for example, spirituality, and then the Marvel comic series, uh, Luke Cage, the second series. Mm -hmm. The villain had a heavy uh, Jamaican influence on the, on the film, right. showing a lot of, once again, rituals and things like that. And Louisiana is so Catholicized, and that's so taboo to talk about mm -hmm. where I live at. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about candles and herbs and light and sage, and right. it's not cool to talk about that mm -hmm. where I'm from. Right, so I'm glad that these films and these shows are bringing that back up. I Say it again, sister. I said, my brother, I think that's about everywhere. That that hasn't really. Yeah, I'm sure. You no, know, it's it's breaking down in small groups in different places. So we see that it's becoming more like, say, for Atlanta, for instance, it's more popular here, or say maybe in New York. You know what I'm saying? Oh, oh, oh there's more uh there's more different cultures and stuff. And so it's mm -hmm. out, it's breaking out, but still the overall consensus with African spirituality is that it's evil. Yes. You're right. Could people that are that are attributing it to evilness, they're religious people. Mm. Yes. Now if you ask yes. it, just a regular person, what do they think? They're probably like, I don't really know. But if you ask a religious person, oh my god. You know what I mean? Like you're you're the fucking devil or some shit like that. But they they drink blood and eat fucking body every 
once a month, but hey, okay, what do you, do you? Right. I ain't drank hey, no blood yet. I'm just saying, I ain't drank no blood, but do you? Yes, and what you just said is always my rebuttal. Like, you don't want to talk about uh, uh, having an altar or something like that, but you go to an altar every Sunday. Come right. on. Talk about it. Having, oh. having an altar in your house is like frowned upon. Or oh, y'all putting dirt. Everybody got that. Y'all put ashes on y'all forehead and all this stuff, throwing holy water. Not That's rituals. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, brother. I agree 100 percent with everything you guys are saying. Uh-huh. So so look, Dr. Kobe Kit Bank Cambon, he goes on to say. He says that African family, and I actually put this quote on Facebook. He says, African family socialization has been essentially Eurocentric in focus. Fact. Fact. He said African peer group socialization has been essentially Eurocentric in values and focus. Fact. And then he says our formal education and religious socialization and indoctrination have also been Eurocentric in values and focus. All he right. said thus the African child in America have been caught up in a pathological Eurocentric encroachment dilemma or paradox unwittingly orchestrated, a co-orchestrated by too many miseducated African parents, too many educated African educators in Eurocentric schools and educational models, too many educated African religious leaders and community leaders, and too many miseducated African scholars who are supposedly experts in this area and who have been providing guidelines for the African community's redevelopment. That's right. So I thought that was very, um, Powerful. So then he moves on, sis, what I, and this is like my favorite part of the chapter. I know we're nearing the end. He says that the ideal track or pattern of an African self-consciousness development would entail, he says, African cultural, African cultural centered parental values and early childhood socialization experiences within the family geared toward African nation, African nation building maintenance. It also it also encompasses other significant institutional and indoctrinating support systems during early childhood, such as African-centered peer groups, neighborhood and community environments, schools, religious practices, media, economic system, political system, and et cetera. So Sister Alima, that goes back to what you and I have been talking about um, for some time now, how you're in Atlanta, I'm in Baltimore, and, um, you know, remember I was talking to you about different behaviors that Jalen picked up in school, um, different behaviors that Harvey and Isaiah picked up. And I was frustrated. And I said, what it was going on, Sister Lima, is that the neighborhood that we live in, the schools that they attend and the peer groups that they have, um, the, the, the culture and, and the ideology values of these groups are not aligned with mine. And yeah. our household. So that's where the disconnect comes from. We don't live in a neighborhood with African centered children. That's right. You know, and it's not yeah. like they attend African centered schools. You know, um, we, we I try to get them involved in as many African centered activities as, po- as possible. Like I'm a part of a family book club. We meet bi weekly. Uh, we pour libations. We talk to the children and we read um, uh, Afrocentric books. And we, meet, you know, bi-weekly, whenever Reality Speaks has a lecture, they bring in uh, Ashwal Kwesi. Um, they brought in a whole bunch of folks. They brought in Dr. Patricia Newton. Um, they brought in uh, Walima Baruti. They brought, brought them in. So I make sure I take them to different lectures. When we have different festivals, I take them to a Doom Day. Um, I, I took them to um, Juneteenth Festival. So I try to expose them to different things or African uh, we pour libations again. Like I try to in, in, involve them in everything that I do, African centered, you know, wise. Oh. But it's hard, sis, when you live in an environment that that isn't where the culture and the, and the behavior and the values, you know, aren't aligned with that of your household. It's really hard because that's when the the confusion comes into place. Like I remember Isaiah told me sometimes he feels like he's being he said pulled in two totally different directions. Right. You know, double consciousness. Yeah, right. double consciousness. Double consciousness. So, and, um, and I, hmm? I know you ladies are in a bigger market, a bigger city than where I'm at right now. And I know we bash the conscious community on, on social media all the time. We bashing, you know, whole and things like that. But where I live at, it's almost like a consciousness desert, if you will, like a food mm-hmm. desert. 
Mm. Like that unk behind you, I don't think anybody around me will even know what that even is when they see it. Oh, wow. It's that far removed. So imagine, you know, my kid's not around anything like that at all. Like what's so, besides whatever I'm doing. North Carolina. Oh my God. <laughs> you know. You, yes. want about, you want to talk about no culture. Shit. If I if I meet if I meet a fellow brother or sister just wearing uh locks or they're wearing some shells or just some, you know, uh, a stone. I might ask her a question like, man, what's that stone? And then with that one question, she know we're on the same page on, on the same page. And now we have this rich dialogue. But besides that, mm. you're not coming across quote unquote consciousness in everyday walking life where I live at. That's why this book club is important to me because, you know, I'm reading these books and we dialoguing about it. I can't normally do this where I live at. Mm. They don't care about African culture where I live at. They're like, man, come on, show them with these books, man. Get out of here with all that. <laughs> I don't want to hear all that. You know how I many people that told me that? I want to hear that shit now. Come on now, sis. Come on, man. Come on, bro. That's the past, man. <laughs> right, that's the past. That's the we're, past. Trying to, we're trying to see Kiki, you know. We're trying to see Kiki. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, our kids, my own kids, I had, uh, you know, because a thousand to one books at the house and try to show them culture and different things. But that's only five or 10 percent of their total life. Like right. you said, whenever they go to school and whenever they ride the bus mm -hmm. and the friends they're making and the sports they're playing, man, that's not even close to a conversation. That's right. Amongst them. That's right. Besides the Black Panther movie, that's the closest we ever came was Black Wakanda. <laughs> Wakanda. That's my only, my only three months, of, my only three weeks are like, okay, here we go. I can, I can, I can infuse something in right quick while we're on this Wakanda kick, you know what I'm saying? So let me, hold on, let me go here too. Let me show you guys this really fast. I want to move on. Ah, where is it? Can you see my screen, Sister Lima? Here it is. I can. All right, here it is, here it is. So Dr. Kobe Cambon on page 123, he shows us a diagram called the dual pathways of African personality development. So he's saying, okay, you know, if you're in an African centered space, i.e. Um, you're undergoing an African centered socialization process, right? He's saying that that will, uh, that will engender or precipitate a moderate to strong African self-consciousness all right so if you see it it's funny i, this, I would laugh when i looked at this diagram so you see how the child the african child initially has a black head and so you have the family surrounding the child and also the community right so when the when the african child undergoes an african-centered socialization pro process meaning that this african child is reared in an african-centered environment what does that mean that this child participates in african life cycle rituals celebrations, commemorations, annual African cultural rituals, right? You have the presence of African cultural icons. You know, I mean, this is important. You know, in your household, do you have pictures of Marcus Garvey up? Do you have pictures right. of Malcolm X up or, or, or Winnie Mandela or uh, Khalid Muhammad or uh, Kwame Nkrumah or uh, Patrice Lumumba? Like, what is up in your house? You get what I'm saying? Do you have this in your house? What rituals are you celebrating? You know, are you still celebrating Christmas, Thanksgiving, the 4th of July? And I'm saying it correctly, the 4th of July and, you know, and all of that. I mean, what kind of rituals are you celebrating? You know, um, so anyway, it says that when you're when this child is reared in an African centered environment, OK, that it, it produces a modern to strong African self-consciousness uh, rooted in African nation building maintenance and African uh, affirmation. But when that African child is developing in a Eurocentric space, i.e. this child uh, undergoes a Eurocentric socialization process, uh, and they're in an environment where they practice Eurocentric life cycle rituals. And I mean, and look at this, annual uh, Eurocentric cultural rituals, uh, presence of European cultural icons. Think about this. How many of our grandmothers have the last supper on the wall? with all of the white, right. white Jesus and, and the white disciples. How many of our grandparents had that? The picture of the white Jesus on the wall, right? So yes. the Euros, it says the presence of European cultural icons. Let's go to, you know, let's go, let's think of school. Let's think of, you know, our children learning about George Washington, our children learning about Christopher Columbus, our children learning about That's Abraham right. Lincoln, right? European cultural icons, which are really anti-African icons. George Washington owned right. slaves. Right. 
Columbus killed millions. I mean, come on now. These are anti-African icons. So what does this do? You look at the black head. The black head slowly but surely dissipates. Look at this. Now you have a, a child that's suffering from modern to severe cultural misorientation, which means that you have an African child who is operating with a European consciousness, i.e. a European survival thrust. Okay? So they'll lie, they'll lie, they'll lie, they'll Go ahead, brother. Now, so he did good with these diagrams. Oh, yeah. He did an excellent job with the diagrams. So I believe before the conclusion, the last, I believe the, the before the, well, this is the section before the conclusion. He, it, there's a section called an Afro, an Afrocentric profile of an African child in America, right? So he says that he, he's given us a description of what a strong African self-consciousness in an African child looks like. What does that look like? So one, I'm at the bottom of page 122, brother. Um, for one, he says that Afrocentric children at the younger age ranges, such as one to three and four to seven years, should at least be developing or have developed a solid sense of their African racial identity and a positive valuation of it relative to non-Africans. Look at mm -hmm. Brother Jonathan. Come on, Brother Jonathan. You're saying it's not happening. I'm not, I don't. I don't know what that looks like. I've never right. seen it. Yep, it's I've sad. never witnessed that. That's sad. So he's saying that these young know, ages, at these young ages, we should have. They should understand their race, their African racial identity, or have a solid sense of it. He says in a positive valuation of it re relative to other non-Africans. Two, he says at the early age. He says, in other words, he says, in other words, at an early age, the child. I'm sorry, at the child, or no, sorry, early age ranges be to identify some objects. Okay, so this is two. This is two. I'm sorry. It says, in addition, they should have a beginning or rudimentary sense of the central importance of African nation building and maintenance, i.e., they should be able to identify some objects and activities that are good versus not good for African people. So that's the second thing. You said, no, brother Jonathan. Thirdly, oh, for two. Look, look thirdly, it says that these young children should possess, it says some elementary knowledge of African cultural practices, rituals, history, and creative production such as art, prose, poetry, music, and song. All right? So you say, well, Dr. Ma'ai, how can I do that? How can I make sure that? As parents, if you don't know, if you can't give your child the information, by the tools that are out there. Look at this. We have tools available to us. It's, it's no reason, Brother Jonathan, that our young babies, that our young babies at the ages of one to three, four to seven, so at the ages of one to seven, should not have a, a solid sense of their African racial, I'm sorry, African racial identity and a positive valuation of it, or be able to identify objects and activities that are good uh, that are good versus not good for our people and knowledge about African cultural practices. Stop allowing your child, stop putting Disney in front of your child, Disney, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, put books in front of your child that teaches your child about his ancestors, where he came from. There are tools out there. Aaron knows about Africa by sister Naomi Bradley and brother Benjamin Infa, brother, in I'm sorry, Benjamin Inja, brother Black Panther. All right? mm -hmm. We have books. We have books. We have the Meltrek program, right? You have Meltrek storybook right here. And not only do we have storybooks, we have films. So get your children mm -hmm. off of Disney, Cartoon Network, Cartoon Network, Disney, and what's the other one, Sister Lima? Uh, uh, that other crap, right? So stop allowing mainstream media, which is controlled by Jews, to, to condition your children's mind. Tell me who I am. Tell me who I am. Beautiful films out here created, created to motivate our babies and teach them of themselves. And this is from my son. This is what's in his stuff. Look at this. Tales from the Underground Railroad. Five brilliant scientists. Five brave explorers. Picture book of Sojourner Truth. Picture book of George Washington Carver. Look at this. Smile, my chocolate prince. Rosa Parks, 
Harriet Tubman, books about Kwanzaa, books about Ida B. Wells. No, that's right, Jalen. You better push through with your 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 books, Jalen. <laughs> Look at this. I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> the, the story of the story of I set a saw in her room. That's hot, man. Look at this, Queen and Zinga. Yes. Wow. Marcus Garvey. He's read these books. Marcus Garvey. That's hot. Mandela, mm. Jomo Kenyatta, Malcolm Little. He also has an encyclopedia of African American heritage. And this isn't all. So, you know, we can't, we, <laughs> if we want to develop African centered children, we have the tools to do so. It's, it's, it's no excuse. You know, at this point, really no excuse unless you just don't want to at this point. Exactly. You know, it's either you want to or you don't. But don't sit around here and tell me how conscious mm. you are and, you know, and, and your babies are tuned into garbage every day. I commend Sister Alima. Let me tell you one thing about this queen. Let me tell you why I admire her. Sister Alima pulled her babies out of the public school system. She pulled them out. And a lot of people of us, including myself, you know, we are afraid to make that transition, to make that move. You know, it's like, okay, well, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna teach my child? You know, um, and then you're thinking of your schedule. Some people are working. You might be in a one parent household, a two parent household. So you're like, I don't want them to go to public school, you know, but I, I don't know how to, I don't know how I'm going, how I'm gonna, you know, educate them at home. This sister pulled her babies out of public school system and she and her husband, are developing an African-centered curriculum for their children. You know, I mean, she puts up stuff. Sister Alima, can you please tell them some of the stuff that's included in your curriculum? I know you teach them about Ifa. I know they're learning Yoruba, okay? They're learning Yoruba. Uh, she's teaching them about Ifa. They learn math. They learn science. Uh, Sister Alima, did I leave out anything? They have their reading time, their writing time. You got you got um, um, Learning. They're learning chemistry, they're learning economics, um, they're learning about money, uh, social studies, geography, mm. like but everything that I can really think of, just about every subject that I feel like they need to know, and I'm not necessarily teaching them what they necessarily need to know on their grade level. Because, you know, they got this whole grade level thing where you teach them this this year. Then you teach them this this year. But I, don't, I just don't think that, that is, that's necessary. I think you teach them right. to know when you feel like they can understand it. Absolutely. That's what we're doing right yeah. now. Like we just got finished learning about the Federal Reserve. You know what I mean? And inflation and interest rates. And, and they've all got hundreds on their tents. So. That's powerful. I mean, it's it, hot, it, man. It's you hot. can do it, family. Like, find out a way. See, see about the laws in your state. A lot of states allow um, homeschooling co-ops and groups to where even if you have to work, there may be a homeschooling, you know what I mean, near you where your child can go. You know, so there's there's different things that you can try to see if you can to make it work for you, family. And I know that it's scary because I was very afraid initially. And so even when I first pulled them out, they still kind of really weren't homeschooled because we were using a K-12 curriculum. But even using the K-12 curriculum and having them at home. So I was cool because I had them at home, but they were still being miseducated mm -hmm. because I was still using their curriculum. Their stuff, right. That, that really put yeah. me over the edge was, um, what were they talking about? It was Black History Month and they were talking about, um, I feel like the end of slavery. And they were the question was posed, it was put in a way like, basically it was saying that, it was ended because impatient African-Americans, and this is literally how they put it, impatient African-Americans decided to stand up and take and take a stand. And, you know, I contacted everybody from the highest level that I could to let them know, like, what the fuck is your problem? You think that somehow they needed to exhort patience because they wanted to be free from being someone's property. So you see what I'm saying? They, they, if you're going to teach your kids, because I know a lot of parents that still have their children in K-12 curriculum, but they're at home and they call them homeschool. But the state doesn't even consider that to be homeschool. Mm. 
not using your curriculum. You're still basically, it's the same thing. They're just not in a brick and mortar. So I don't, I don't condone um, if you're going to take them out to still use that curriculum because it's, it's just the same. But I say you take them out when you feel that you're ready. And it's really not as hard as you think it would family. It's not all the stress and pressures that I put on myself for all the years, the thought that I couldn't do it. But it's really not as hard as, you know, as I thought. It's just not. I will say I commit that. that I say that I've made, especially for my daughters, because the biggest thing for me is that we don't our children don't learn the way that they teach. No, they don't. They taught is right. the way that they teach is like cram sessions. I don't we we only do three subjects per week. So I don't even we don't do a little bit of every subject every day because I want to make sure that they actually retain the information that they're learning. That's hot, man. I totally commend you for that. Uh, yes. I salute that. But y'all can do it though, family. I just I, I, my my head my head go off for you, sister Lima. I'm like. <sighs> you know, sis, and then taking a new job, and it's just, you know, I talk to you offline, just trying to figure it all out. Right. Um, just trying to figure it all out, sis, you know, that's all. But uh, I, think I, I admire what you did with your babies. Um, I wasn't of this mindset with, with like Harvey and Isaiah. With Jalen, yes. Um, with Harvey and Isaiah, no, not, not so much. Um, wasn't African-centered. I was on my pro-black kick and black right. national kick but I, I didn't know anything about pan-africanism you know i wasn't i wasn't on that kick right. until about um five years ago right. maybe about four or five years ago that's when i became african center but prior to that you know i was on my bro my pro-black kick and i didn't understand african center the africanity right. didn't understand that um so anyway sis i just wanted to share with the family what you got going on because I, I definitely um definitely admire you for doing what you did uh, it takes patience. It takes discipline. It took a lot of courage, you know, to pull your babies out of there. Because a lot of us are comfortable. We're just we're comfortable dropping our children off. It's convenient. You drop yes. them off. You go to work. You see them eight hours later. And so somebody else has the responsibility of developing right. your minds. You don't have it. It's convenient for a lot of us. You know, I say I used to say all the time, it's free childcare. Yeah, it is. It's, it is. it's daycare, but it's free. You know it what I'm is. saying? I, I've heard a lot of parents say, oh, I mean, like, soon as summer hits, oh, my God, what am I going to do with these kids all day? Right. I can't wait till school come. Like, listen to how you sound. Mm -hmm. like, it's lazy. You can't wait. Like, you don't want to spend time with your children is what it boils down to because my children are right. always busy. Like, always. You know what I'm saying? Unless I literally have an adult time, they're with me 24 seven, but I want that because yes. I want to be able to know what they're doing. I want to be able to know how the fuck somebody's talking to them. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Or how they're treating them. That that's the biggest thing for me that I was uncomfortable with at school was not knowing what was going on. And then for them to come tell me certain things. And I'm like, she said that to you. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean? like, they did that. Like I just, I couldn't do it. I know me. And you know, the last straw, I'll say this real quick because Brother Shams is trying to get in. But the last straw for me, family, when I pulled them out was that at their school, they didn't have a uniform policy, but their principal was trying to push her ideas of what she felt the children should wear. So she would entice them in her afternoon messages with parties and saying that if you wear your uniform, then at the end of the month, your class will be eligible for a party. And the teachers took it even further and they would make the children in class who didn't have on uniforms feel bad by kind of in inadvertently stating that if you don't wear a uniform, then the class can't get a, a, a party because you don't have on a uniform. And I saw my children, and I'm trying not to get emotional here, but I saw my children conforming right before my eyes because they wanted to attend a party. You see what I'm saying? So I have to let that principal know, number one, I don't appreciate it. You trying to manipulate these children into doing what the fuck you wanted them to do. And number two, since when are children not individuals? Like, I don't have this mindset that most people have when it comes to children. I just don't. They are miniature adults. Yeah. That's what people. they are. And all they're doing is literally teaching them. Like, they're not something for you to control 
and maintain just for the meanwhile until they get 18. You know what I'm saying? So how do you take away a child's individual right to make their own decision? You manipulate them. That's how you take away their right. You know what I'm saying? And, and for me, that was the last straw when I saw my daughters coming out the house and they have on uniforms. And you want to talk about somebody was sitting in the car after I dropped them off crying because I understood that it was deeper than that. You know what I'm saying? I understood psychologically that it was deeper than that. And I got emotional when I see these kids at the end of the day, when I saw the first five days, everybody wore what they wanted to wear. And then weeks after that, everyone has on a fucking uniform. Mm. I couldn't do it anymore, family. That was it for me. So after I cussed that bitch out and let her know where to stick it and told the same thing to the, the superintendent, I took my kids out the next day. Mm. Mm. I'm telling you, sis, a lot of us won't take a stand. We just, we just, we just, you know, we just go with the flow. And I mean, let's think about this, sis. You know, it was powerful when you said to me, it struck out, stuck out to me when you said, you know, I'm concerned about what, what someone is saying to them, you know, what, what, you know, what they're seeing every day, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the teachers. I'm thinking about the other students who might be uh, exhibiting behaviors that, that we don't do in our house, you know, cause I remember Jalen was coming home cursing, you know, cursing is, he was cursing in Spanish and then he was spelling curse words. And I'm like, well, where did you learn how to spell a curse word? He's like, you know, so-and-so told me, you know, so he's, spe he's spelling shit and fuck and, and I'm like, we don't spell this, this, you know, it, so how are you like five years old, six years old coming in the house, knowing how to spell curse words, you know? And so when we send our babies to school, we are opening them up, you know, and exposing them, sis, to, you know, behaviors from other children, behaviors that children are bringing from their household, uh, biases that teachers may come to school with and, 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 and exude unconsciously and consciously, unconsciously and consciously. So we're really opening our children up. So it just it just makes you wonder, like, do we really love them? You know, just to say, hey, give somebody else the let somebody else educate them. Let somebody else hold their minds. Let somebody else acculturate them. Is this is that really is is that loving our babies and valuing our children? I remember in the miseducation of the Negro, uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson said that black people are the only people who will give their most precious possessions, their children, over to their oppressors to right. motivate their minds. He right. said, We're the ones that do it. You know these people are oppressing you. And what do you do? We just give them our babies. Here, acculturate them more. Indoctrinate, indoctrinate them more. So I, go ahead, sis. No, I said, that's right. I'm just echoing, Queen. That's yeah. right. Yeah, so it's like, it, it makes you wonder, like, do we really love them? And I'm not saying that we don't love our children, but as Dr. Amos Wilson said, he said we have a distorted love for our children. We love them, right. but it's distorted. Okay? That's right. It's distorted. Hey, hey, what up? But I want to chime in with the homeschool piece. This just happened where I live at last Thursday. This is recent news. Just in, they all of a sudden the school board dropped. They will no longer uh, have writing and spelling in school. They are no longer graded where I live at. And if you get caught cheating on the test, you will no longer be penalized. And if you caught cheating on the test, you will be allowed to retake the test with no kind of uh, reprimand. So I'm like, how do you take our spelling and writing? In school, let alone with everything else they've taken out already, you're taking out PE classes, what? you're taking out other things like you almost have to homeschool now. That's what I wanted to say a little while ago. She was saying what she was saying, like, brother, it's not that's really like optional anymore. You kind of have to, brother. That's in Louisiana, yes, ma'am. Lafayette, Laf it's called Lafayette Parish. This is this last Thursday. They all of a sudden came out with this rule. School starts here in about two weeks. The parents didn't get a chance to vote on it. We didn't mm -hmm. all come together and agree on it. They just said, you know what? We're doing this. And you go to your Facebook and start a little thing on the news screen, you know, like starting this school year, there's no longer writing assignments. There's no longer spelling assignments. How do you no longer doing writing this, and spelling, my brother? Like, how, how do you get out one of the core, know. one of the core things that you, if you can't properly write, you can't do any of the other well, stuff. Yeah. I agree. If you ladies may be aware of it or not, we in Louisiana are the bottom, the last state in the whole country in education already. No. Mm. We're, we're, we're bottom last out of all the states already for the past three or four years and running, and you're going to remove something else? 
So another, I question uh, seven or eight educators in my circle. Like, why do you think a group of adults sat at a table and decided like this is the move to make? They feel like they're trying to increase the scores to make the state look better, uh, get some quote unquote A rated schools and B rated schools instead of all these D and F schools that we have. But it's a skewed thing. Just like Raheem Shabazz said in the Elementary Genocide DVDs, like we're chasing test scores, not worried about the kids. And I was the kids, man. That you know what? Sister Amica, mm. sister, shout out to Sister Amica. I love that queen. Mm. She's been helping me a lot, getting me set up with homeschool. And you know, she's the one who really broke it down for me because I was confused. I thought that I thought that regardless whether I pulled them out or not, that they still had to take some type of integrated test. Because North Carolina is like that. So even if you homeschool them, they still have to take a standardized test test at the end of the uh, year. Here, here too. Oh, mm -hmm. so like that too? Oh, okay, mm -hmm. brother. Well, it's not like Georgia. So in Georgia, it's like, I'm, I'm glad that we're here because Georgia is one of the most freest homeschool states. Like, they don't fuck with you. They basically, they want you to have, have your kid tested like third grade, fourth grade, eighth grade. But you take you you give them whatever testing you want and keep those for your records. So when it's time for them to you know graduate high school, but I didn't know. So I was I was under the impression that when they said in the grade, I was thinking it still meant through the state. So that's why I had opted to go ahead and use their curriculum anyway. If they were still going through the state, but Sister Amica put me up on game and she was like, "No, you don't have to do that." And secondly, she's like, "Those test scores are based off money." So the reason yeah. why they're trying to cram. Yeah stuff into your baby and then trying to get your baby to get a three or four it's not because they care it's because it's about money and those teachers are going to cram them even harder because they get bonuses off of it mm. this how to risk stay richer right whenever my daughter was going to a, a drf rated school whenever the school year came around our school supply list was like massive yeah we're going to a school or b school yeah, she had a very small school supply list because the school supplied everything she needs I'm so, so as long as they are high graded schools, funded. they're getting funded. I thought yes. mugging. I can't believe he said that because I, I noticed the same thing. I said when the girls in North Carolina at them funky schools, yo, they they didn't have nothing. You had to bring everything, and you yeah, they asked for toilet tissue, my brother. Yes, they did. Oh, us too. Toilet tissue, clean next paper towels, hand sanitizer. Mm. Wow. Yeah, wow. You, you got a class of twenty five kids. We got to bring toilet tissue for everybody. That's what I used to say. Why y'all don't got no toilet <laughs> tissue? Damn. Mm. But yeah, it's so you know the the, the schools to get the money. So, places that can't even buy toilet tissue, and you think that right. they're gonna educate your baby properly, right? Oh, and I forgot one more thing. They will no longer have homework. I didn't mention that part when I gave the layout. They are no longer having homework. So my son, who's nineteen now, I I watched him for four years, freshman through senior year. Polly Ballard had homework maybe under 10 times. What? And I was an active parent going to the parent conferences. I'm trying to catch him in a lie. So I asked this teacher, man, my son claiming he don't have homework. I'm waiting to catch him in a lie. And the teacher said, well, no, Mr. Sean, he, he's right. We, we, don't, we don't give homework. We don't believe in homework. What? What kind of stuff is that? What kind of stuff is that? Brother, you said you're a 18-year-old? Yeah, my son, yes. How old are you? Like, I thought he was, so, yo, I swear to God, like, African people, I can never guess our fucking age. I just knew for sure he was, like, 26 or 27. And he has a 19. I will take that. I will take that compliment. I'm, 30, I'm 36. I'll be 37 in December. Wow. That's fucking crazy. I look young. That, that is crazy. Man. My mind is blown. It's a blessing. No way. Whoa. Yeah, it's, it's a gift of the curse. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. They, I can't even get a people try People try playing with me like I'm a little boy. They, they, they try playing me. I'm like, hold on, man. I can't even get a cigarette. I'm, I'm, I'm not no little youngster, youngster, man. I got a grown man's son. <laughs> you know. I don't know. Yeah. But I just want to mention that piece with the homeschooling and, uh, of course, the African Center education. And at first, it was kind of like optional, but now it's getting it's, it's picking up the mind. pace to where yes. if you don't take after school from five to eight o'clock and do your own curriculum like okay we're gonna spell words we're gonna and do then, and then look we're gonna do this is cursive writing years ago I, 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 I heard about that but this is my thing and then i want to definitely move on because we got like four or five more yes. pages not really four or five more pages it's just like one one more thing that i want to touch on before i, we I gotta ride out actually but i hit the last point before i leave yeah but look um 
you know, and even if we do send them to public schools, um, they need to have like a balance. So for example, um, in Howard County here in Maryland, uh, they have a huge Asian population. And I was told by um, a cousin of mine who works in Howard County, um, in the Howard County school system, that the Asian children during the day, they'll go to the public schools out there. But then in the evening, she said they actually, not even the evening, they get bused from the schools to like an Asian school, like a Chinese school, where they learn their culture. So it's like they're getting two educations. And what I see happening with us is that we send our children to these uh, public schools and they just come home, they're playing video games, they're running around the neighborhood. They're not getting to education. They're not learning their ways and then our ways. They're just learning their ways, you know? And, um, but the Asians have it set up in Howard County, right here in Maryland, where their children get two educations, the Eurocentric education and an Asian or Chinese education. Hmm? So they have a balance. That's very smart. I like that. But uh, so Dr. Kobe Cambon on page 125, he says, by the time the child is between the ages of eight and 12 years old, he's saying they should have developed a more assertive, self-affirming, Ma'adian disposition reflecting a strong sense of collective African identity and be capable of early African self fort fort um, fortification, self preservation, and self defense manifestations. He says adolescents between the ages of 13 and 18 should be able to develop these African centered psychological qualities even further to the point of being able to form and develop substantive action patterns reflective of rudimentary Afrocentric institution development, like, cult like African cultural centered peer groups, programs, and activities. Um, African history study groups in the school with the neighborhood community areas of people activity and demonstrate a growing substantive sense of obligation and responsibility to the broader African community and nation building and maintenance. And he says that all of these Afrocentric personalities attribute developments in African children presume a active African centered parenting, b significant others in community institutional support systems. Um, so lastly, I thought that this was a very powerful paragraph, and this is, you know, all I have to say uh, on, on this chapter. But he says that a mature African personality with a strong sense of African self-consciousness, as has been stated, would be one who has a strong sense of her collective African identity, i.e. a conscious collective self, I'm sorry, a conscious collective sense of self and African spirituality as the core of her being. This would require the African person to define herself in collective communal terms. Remember when Sister Alima and I were talking, uh, we used the words we, you know, even if it wasn't necessarily us, we would say we, you know, everything was we, us, okay? So communal terms, recognizing that she is obligated to the community and that she can have no meaningful existence outside of the community. Her beingness is tied to the African community past, present, and future of which it is her destiny to serve, the, to serve, to reaffirm through her life and to defend and protect with her life. Such an African person would also possess a commitment to increasing her knowledge of her African history and cultural heritage in the world and to develop cultural institutions to preserve and perpetuate the African cultural affirmation in the world. Such a person then recognizes the necessity of African self-transformation as a lifelong process and requires African-centered and centered institutional mediums, institutional mediums and support systems to carry out this vital process of African affirmation. Thus, the, the mature African personality sees her role and function in African nation building maintenance as the center of her universe of life priorities. Maybe. So, since I had to, I had to read that. I thought that that was um, a powerful uh, paragraph um, in this chapter, you know. So, um, so I had nothing else left, sis, in this chapter. I mean, he goes on, he gives a conclusion where he summarizes everything that we, we went over, and he's just saying, look, you know, in order to save our race from cultural devastation, and he said ultimate physical destruction. He said, we contemporary African community must redefine, reconceptualize, and redirect the nature and pattern of African parenting and socialization with regards to African-centered community infrastructure redevelopment based on some clear African-centered guidelines and standards. 
So we have to do some reconstruction, some reconception, some redefining, redirecting, he's saying, you know, in order to save us from cultural devastation. That's, right. That's what the Baba is saying. So I don't have anything left, Sister Alima. Um, I don't have anything left uh, to say on this chapter. Do you have anything, Queen? I don't. I don't. Summarize it. This was a powerful bill. What is the next chapter? What is the title of the next chapter? I want to show the family a flyer really quick. Um, can you, could you tell me the next chapter, Queen? I want to show them a flyer. Yes, I want to save this. Chapter six is called The African Personality and African Mental Health. Oh, wow. That's, that's a must. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're going to be reading next week, family. So join in, tune in, same time. Um, at nine o'clock, which is probably the next 10, 15, within the next 10 minutes, uh, Sister Naya and myself, Sister Lima, will you be joining us? Yeah, I'll be joining Queen. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'm trying to pull up this flyer. Okay, so we're going to be meeting uh, in 10 minutes. So you can look at the flyer. It says, calling all the sisters. All right. Uh, join Dr. Ma'ana, Sister Naya says to study African womanism. We're going to be uh, putting together a women's study group. Um, to discuss to this to study what does it mean to be an African woman? Um, a lot of our sisters right now are being drawn to feminism, and if it's not feminism, then it's black feminism. If it's not black feminism, then it's you know African feminism. If it's not African feminism, then it's Alice Walker's uh, womanism. So um, you know there are sisters like myself, sisters like Naya, sisters like Sister Alima. And we're like, okay, we're not with all that, but what's the what's the alternative for African women? And there's this this literary theory that was developed by uh, Dr. Clonora Hudson Weems called African Womanism. And so we're putting together a, we put together a study group. We're going to meet every Saturday, um, every, I'm sorry, every Sunday from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, right here on this channel, um, starting on uh, August the first. We might push it. Um, push it, um, push it back a little bit, but um, we're going to be meeting to the to, to study this book. And what will what will we learn? It says one, we'll learn, you know, what is African Africana womanism? Who developed the concept of womanism, and how is it different from feminism, Black feminism, uh, African feminism, or Alice Walker's womanism? How can African womanism shape the African American experience and improve the relationship between the Black man and a Black woman, right, in the community and family? How does African womanist ideology contribute to the Afrocentric discourse, traditional Africana philosophy and Afrocentric social theory? So all of these questions will be answered. Uh, join us in the next 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, the background of Dr. Clonora Hudson Wings. We're going to talk a little bit about the book. Uh, and then we're going to I'm going to play maybe 20, 25 minutes of her lecture and we're going to close out. So we're definitely going to keep it um, under under an hour. So join us in about 10, 15 minutes. Um, I don't have anything left to say, Sister Lima, to the crowd or to the listening audience. Let me go here. Let me stop sharing. My screen. Family, we thank you for joining us. Of course, we'll see you on another edition of the Ram Book Club next Sunday at 7 p.m. Oh, and hold up. One more thing, sis. I want to show them this. If you want to read more about uh, the developmental psychology of the black child and stuff like that, grab these two books. I want to show you this. This was a great book, The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child by Dr. Amos Wilson. Um, I read it as you guys. Can. I mean, I, I combed through it. And uh, look, another one he had out, um, The Awakening, Awakening the Genius, the Natural Genius of the Black Children. I haven't uh, gotten into this one, but if you want to read more about it, about uh, learning about you know black children, how to produce you know African centered children. Um, I definitely recommend that you grab these two books. All right, family, we out of here. Peace and power. <laughs>